You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking to Professor Robert Desjardins, who is a cultural anthropologist and who teaches anthropology at Sarah Lawrence College, where I have to say my sister went many, many years ago. Um, he's the author of four books and is currently working on a fifth. His most recent book, which is the book that I have to say I have, uh, I've really enjoyed reading, is called Counterplay, An Anthropologist at the Chessboard, which was published by the University of California Press. Robert, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. In Counterplay, you, you describe the, the fascination with playing chess as being almost like a drug. And uh, I will admit that, though I don't know much about drugs, I do know about chess, and I, I do find it's kind of got this, I don't know, maybe narcotic effect is the way you describe it. Um, do you think this is really a fair comparison? In, in, in what way would you say chess players really are like addicts? Um, well, I think I would I, I use that comparison chiefly as an analogy, uh, as a kind of metaphor to get the reader to to understand what it's like to play chess and how captivating it is. And I think there are a lot of affinities that chess really grabs a person's attention and, and really sort of sucks them in, into this particular kind of world of, of these squares and these knights and bishops. Um, and even the, the etymology of the word addicted um, goes back to this notion of being bound to something or sworn to it that you're sort of sworn to paying back debts because you've been gambling. This goes back to ancient Rome. And with chess, I think there is often a sense of a, a, a kind of loss of freedom and agency that you're sort of captivated by the game and taken within it. And you lose often even a sense of self. And I've seen that with a lot of chess players. I've seen guys spend most of their free time playing chess in tournament settings, night after night, weekend after weekend. And I think it could clearly be an addiction. Um, and... I would certainly take chess over heroin any day, but there's something of, along the same lines. There's um, a kind of endorphin rush that comes with chess. Chess is often very pleasing and pleasurable, and it's very compelling, too. It compels one to keep with it, um, and hours and days and weeks can fly by invested in chess. I spent whole summers playing chess and studying chess, and that was the main thing I wanted to do with my life at that time. Mm -hmm. And are there, I think I'll, mm -hmm. are, there, are there other legal activities that, that could be comparable? Um, I think so. I think there's these chess, the sort of passion people have for chess is probably not so different from the other kinds of passions that people have, be it artistic endeavors or playing video games or doing crossword puzzles or travel. I think also some people are kind of obsessive or addicted to social relations and are sort of addicted to constant interactions with others. And I think what makes chess stand out is the, the maniacal zeal that some people have for the game. Um, and so... As far as addictions go, I think it, it sort of has corollaries with other kinds that people have, and maybe it's more noticeable because it stands out more in that so way. For people who are not necessarily of an addictive personality, meaning they don't have other addictions, what do you think makes them become uh, so obsessed with the game? You know, they'll literally spend hours, days, months, give up relationships. Right. Yeah, it's intensely captivating, um, and I think it has many different dimensions to that. The chess is not easily figured out. There's a kind of mystery to chess. And one, once one gets good at chess and, and understands what's going on, it, it's almost like you're stepping into this realm of physics and, and, and a kind of ge geometric beauty that really um, captures the mind in a way. And also each game is a, in itself is a kind of suspenseful story that you're, once you're in immersed in the game, you're, you're sort of living out this, this story um, in interaction with another person. And that, that holds interest as well. So chess is often very much a, a sense of adventure, too. In the book, I, I talk about playing a game at the Marshall Chess Club in New York City. And this is a long Saturday um, where I'm playing a game against a, uh, a Russian master. And then I get on the, the, the metro train back north heading home. And I have a sentence where I say I felt like a warrior returning from a long, hard battle. And I think people identify with that. Um, I was talking to a friend the other day. And he's thinking of playing in a tournament in a couple weekends. And he said, you know, I haven't been really playing. I haven't been practicing. But I think I'm going to go because you, you know what it's like. It's like you feel really alive when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that people can identify with. You know what I find very... Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, please. I was, was going to say, thing of feeling very alive is the stress 
that uh, my my kids are big chess players and um, uh-huh. I go with them to tournaments and sometimes when I'm able to watch you know the actual game just as as the person watching the game you know my kid the stress for me is unbelievable so <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting yeah it's probably yeah it's probably like being a backseat driver and your kids just learning how to drive in a sense and you can't make the moves yourself yeah. and you can sympathize with them and empathize but um they're there out on their own of course they're so good that you know, I, i'm thinking you know, why'd you do that oh my gosh you just gave something up and it turned out it was of course you know much greater strategy than i could possibly imagine the kids are so good at this uh-huh okay yeah that makes sense and chess is, is as you just noted is very much a social experience there's a kind of mythology that chess is, you know, these lone people in the world completely isolated. But I didn't find that was the case at all. There's very much a sense of camaraderie when people go to chess clubs and to tournaments. People hang out with their friends. They, they go out for games with friends. And so there's a social dimension to it that people, I think, are looking for. They're looking for that sense of connection. And so it's connection not just with the chess board but with other people and talking and thinking about chess. Right. And so chess is also, mm-hmm, please. I say it's such a positive way to do it as, as well. Yes, exactly. And chess is very fun. Um, it's fun to play, as you know, and I'm sure your children know as well. There's an element of play, of just this kind of play of forms on the chessboard and the play of, of thought that a person engages in that I think is is something that people welcome. And I think also play is very, very fundamental to human beings. It's right. like something that's part of our lives, and it should be there. It was an, you wrote about that quite a bit in the book. I thought that was quite an interesting way of looking at human nature. We are talking to Robert Desjardins, who is a cultural anthropologist. He teaches at Sarah Lawrence College, and he is the author of the book Counterplay, an anthropologist at the chessboard, uh, which I have to say I read uh, as an e-book. It was one of the, is the second e-book that I have now read on, on an iPad, and I uh, enjoyed it a great deal. Uh, let me ask you a question. Your, your, your book is from the point of view of an anthropologist at the chessboard. Why is this such a unique view of either anthropology or chess? Um, that's a good question. I think what makes the book different is this kind of anthropological reflection on on the personal and interpersonal worlds that the people are inhabiting in, in the chess world. You know, what makes people tick, what motivates and concerns them, what they imagine and strive for and worry about. And writing the book helped me to sort of understand those things. And I think that in time, there's a certain kind of anthropological imagination or sensibility that develops in an anthropologist to see the world in a certain way, um, how social relationships are working and, and sort of the grounds of people's lives. And I think I was able to sort of lend that vision, that sensibility to the book. The, the first version of the book I wrote as a as a, a kind of nonfiction personal narrative of my engagements with the game. And when it was sent out for review, the reviewers came back with the thought that this is good, it's fine, but what's missing? And it's a shame that this guy's an anthropologist and he's not drawing from anthropological thought to, to take us further into looking at the game from an anthropological perspective. And for a long time, among my anthropology colleagues, I was very kind of shy about telling them I was writing a book about chess because I didn't think it was a, you know, because there's that play element. And I thought that they would think I, I sort of, you know, went, went over to another side of some sort. Um, and only after a while did I realize that it's, it's inherently anthropological. We're really looking at what it means to be human in the world, in, in the contemporary world. Um, and what are the different dimensions of people's lives and what are they looking for? What are they striving for? People are looking for meaning and intensity and connection. And I think a lot of people find that within chess, too. Interesting. I find that your your uh, hesitance to discuss it with your colleagues, I often find that as well as an investment advisor. Right, My, my day job is I, I'm a financial planner. I work with people helping them to, to manage their investments. I only get to do this radio gig once a week. But uh, uh-huh. but talking about uh, people uh, in, investing in terms of chess, to me it seems very logical. I think about it all the time. Tell me something, with all of the study that you've done on chess, do you think that there's a connection between the way maybe people uh, think about chess or are working on the chess board and how they might handle their own personal money? I think so. I think very much. I think that, in speaking of chess, in time a certain kind of chess wisdom develops where a person has a, an intuitive feel for how to move pieces, to develop strategies, and to press for an advantage. And this can include a sense of, of when to be bold and aggressive and when to play it safe. And I think this kind of chess wisdom only comes about through a lot of hard work, studying the game, trying and failing at first, and reflecting on the logic and, and the intricacies of the game. 
And I would imagine that all of this plays out in similar ways in something that we might call financial wisdom. I don't really invest a lot myself. I have uh, mutual funds. Um, but I would imagine that in the world of investing, one has to know how to proceed and invest in energetic ways while avoiding any careless or thoughtless moves, that you really have to have a sense of the board, of the financial board, and how the pieces are intersecting. You have to have a sense of the history of the game that you're playing and a sense of who the other participants are. And you have to have a kind of this kind of wisdom of, of what are good moves. And, and the wisdom that comes with the chess is probably similar to the wisdom of investing, that you have to combine a certain feel for, for how to make the right moves. And you can't be too bold and you can't be too cautious either. And you have to be aware of the different factors involved. Does, I, that, does that correlate with what? With no, I think so. I'll tell you, you had mentioned that you use mutual funds. I've often thought of compared mutual funds, someone who invests using them as someone who uh, wants to have an, an opening in chess, meaning you know, there are a lot of standard openings that people use in, right. in the chess world, and they, they may not be perfect, and they may not get you everything you need, but they, they set you up the right way. And I feel a lot of times a mutual fund is the same concept, meaning it gives you the diversification, you, you're pretty much on target with what you need to be doing, and uh, you know, you may not, it may not be the perfect thing for the end game when you need to, uh, to, uh, to make specific moves, but you know, for someone just basically investing and wanting to get started in the same way someone who's starting a chess game wants to just do the, the package of the right things, which would be an opening that maybe he studied, uh, I think they're very similar. That's interesting. I hear that with a smile because I think it, it makes intuitive sense to me that, that yeah, mutual funds are like these really solid openings that get you into the middle game and you're not going to lose a piece in the first four moves or five moves. And then it's a good solid position to work from. Um, and, and I would imagine trading minute by minute on the, on the stock exchange is like these very sharp openings that we're familiar with where, you know, it's very cutthroat and, and the adrenaline gets going, but there's a lot on the line in that way. Mm -hmm. Or like a blitz game that people game, you know, five minutes. Exactly, so. right. Yeah, exactly. Robert, I hate to say it, but we're, we're just about out of time. We've been talking to Robert Desjardins, who is the author of a fabulous book, which you can buy either as a real book or an e-book, called Counterplay, an anthropologist at the chessboard, which was published by the University of California Press. Uh, I bought it as an e-book on, uh, on Amazon. Um, Robert, just in the last few seconds, can you tell us how people can follow what work you're doing? Um... I think there's a website that's going to be developed at Sarah Lawrence College for the different faculty, and so that's one way. And um, they could always email me if they wanted to. Um, should I give my email address? Yes, yeah, please that, do. Okay, so it's r d e s j a r l at gmail dot com, and I certainly welcome um, emails from people. And um, I think I'm going to be setting up a website where people could follow my work. And um, I'm going back to Nepal this summer to continue my work with the Tibetan Buddhist people in Nepal. Um, that's the other side of my anthropological research. <laughs> All right. It sounds great. Listen, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.